the opportunity and the pleasure of, of uh, being here for our 99th a coffee and conversation. Just amazing when, when we add it all up. Uh, we've been doing our coffee and conversations since 2012. And today we have Lloyd Wade. Uh, Lloyd, speaking of World War II veterans, is a veteran of the 11th Airborne Division. And within that division uh, was with the 127th Engineering Battalion. Uh, or combat engineers uh, and Paul or Paul <laughs> Lloyd has a, a great story to tell us uh, today now I will warn you uh, I had the pleasure of uh, sitting with with Lloyd and uh, getting his bio information to create the handout for today he's already told me that he is not a dynamic speaker okay uh, and he I only, I only talk when somebody talks to me that's right so so, so today we will we will ask Lloyd questions, and Lloyd will respond. Okay, so so that's the way it's going to go. But nevertheless, nevertheless, Lloyd has a great story to tell us uh, about the exploits of the uh, 11th Airborne Division uh, in in New Guinea and the Philippines, and then of course the uh, the raid on on Los Banos, the uh, Japanese prison camp that wasn't so much a prison camp for, for uh, Allied soldiers, but some uh, Allied soldiers, but mostly civilians, um, uh, some nurses, uh, but, but the, the, uh, the raid was one that, uh, that has gone down in, in the history of the uh, US military as, as one of the most successful uh, uh, prison camp uh, uh, raids of uh, of all time in terms of the success of the of the raid, and uh, and Lloyd will tell us about that uh, in a few minutes. So I have some uh, I have some uh, map uh, pictures that will that will show the, uh, later uh, during the talk, uh, both about the raid and and some other pictures uh, that uh, Lloyd will uh, will fill us in on with regard to uh, various campaigns uh, in the Philippines and New Guinea. Uh, and also uh, the fact that uh, the 11th Airborne Division was the, the one of the first U.S. divisions, if not the first U.S. division, uh, to be part of the occupation forces in Japan uh, right after the conclusion of the of the war in the Pacific. So anyway, uh, having said all that, um, we want to also thank you guys for being here and uh, to let you know that we have some com some speakers coming up. Uh, our next speaker uh, on the 12th of March, uh, so this will be our last speaker in February. Then in March we have uh, Scott Stalker. Uh, Scott was a uh, Army Vietnam veteran uh, who served in the Medical Corps uh, between 67 and 71. Uh, he was in Vietnam, uh, I think the year uh, 67 to 68, and was uh, uh, again in the Medical Corps and served in, uh, in the area of Quang, Quang Tri uh, in Vietnam. Uh, on the 26th of March, we have, I, I think, a very good speaker. Uh, her name is Sarah Plummer Taylor. Uh, she was a, a Marine Corps intelligence officer, did two tours in Iraq. Uh, and right now she's very prominent uh, locally in the Denver Metro Boulder County area uh, doing a lot of good uh, uh, work with uh, veterans groups uh, and, uh, and has her own business with regard to uh, um, uh, working with uh, various groups uh, with regard to veterans work and uh, and uh, uh, health coaching and a lot of workshops. Um, as you know, we survive here in the museum with uh, your generous donations. There's donation jars all around the, the building. Um, obviously, you've already taken part in coffee and donuts, which is one of the things we do very well around here. <laughs> uh, help yourself for, for some more. Uh, restrooms are over here on the left uh, going past the office. And uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, um, uh, stick around afterwards. Um, uh, Lloyd's got some great uh, reference books here from the 11th and the, and the 127th for you to look at. Uh, feel free to ask him questions about any of those reference documents. 
Um, and uh, also, uh, when we get into the talk, please check and make sure that your cell phones are, are either turned off or, or on quiet mode or airplane mode or what have you. Um, and, uh, and also, if you guys didn't sign in in the logbook out in front, please make sure to do that. Uh, before you leave today so that we can get credit with the city uh, for your uh, for your visit and uh, and also uh, we have another museum here in the neighborhood uh, up on uh, on 10th going going west the depot museum so if you haven't seen that one it's worthwhile checking out um, so that's about it um, any questions for me before we get started with Lloyd Okie doke. So I'll, let, I'll turn it over to Lloyd. And, uh, and thank you again very much for coming today. Appreciate it. I'm going to hook uh, Lloyd up here and then we'll get started. I see everyone's got a pamphlet here, and that pretty well tells you here is uh, what you're looking for, and uh, tells you about from my time I started up until I finished. And that's the way from a child up to didn't discharge from the service. So on the Las Banias, it's a, that's one of the I think the, the prize thing of what we accomplished over there. And uh, Colin Powell said it was the, one of the best operations that ever existed. And here's the, some stuff here. It's got that in it. It says the Las Banias. And I do have uh, some tapes that I'm going to leave a copy here with you. And uh, oh, okay. then you can make some or keep some or whatever, just so I get them back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, like I said a while ago, I, I'm not a speaker. I'm a listener, and I'll listen to your questions and try to answer anything you might want to talk about. There's a gentleman sitting here in the front row that came to me a while ago, and... Uh, said his father was in the 11th Airborne. And I said, yeah, I said, I got some stuff there. He says, my father got a silver star. I said, if he got a silver star, it's in that book. And he found it. So, so if there's any questions, we <laughs> get started. The sooner we start, the better we'll finish. <laughs> Anyone have any questions at all? So Lloyd, when uh, so talk about first year your your training where it started. I uh, let's just start from Chicago, Georgia, and then go from Georgia to McCall to Camp Polk, and then well, from there to the beginning. Well, I'll I'll start back at Fort Harrison. Okay, all right. And uh, I ran around with. Uh, at that time, a friend of mine was the same age, and you know what 17-year-old guys do. So uh, We'd been friends for a couple of years, and all at once it, it dawned on us, we're either going to get called in the service, or we're going to have to volunteer. So I told Ben, I said, look, I'm going to volunteer because I want to get what I want, not what they want to give me. And I said, are you going with me? Sure, sure, sure. Well, we decided to go over on a Monday and volunteer. Went over to Fort Harrison, sat in a big room, and there's maybe 50 sitting in there. So they asked for volunteers for the parachute troops. That's what I, and I told Ben, that's what I want. Are you going to go with me? Yeah. Well, when they asked for volunteers, my hand went up like that, and I looked around, there wasn't another hand. <laughs> Not even Ben. <laughs> he wouldn't cry. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Oh, I, I don't want to go. 
But uh, at the meantime, what got me started on it, I had read a little about it, and I, the 80, he was in the 82nd, and that was made up earlier, the 101st and 82nd, and we come in third. He uh, was on furlough, and uh, I looked at his uniform and all that. Don told me that's, that's what I'm going to do. So I actually volunteered to go to the 82nd. And uh, we got to Coa, Georgia, and there's about 500 of us there. So we had to run the mountain and do all that kind of stuff. and They washed all of us out, but 300. Oh, that's all they had left. So they said that the next day we'd be into the 82nd. Well, someone woke up that night, I guess, and thought of it. They're going to have another division. So that stopped all of our transfers and everything, and we went in and made up the 11th. That's the way it got started, and that was in 43. And uh, we left there. Of course, you, Tacoa, Georgia has a large mountain down there. And I was raised on a farm, and not bragging, but I was pretty solid. And uh, my name being Wade, I was last on everything. The W, you just wait, 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 and that's it. And uh, I was waiting on it, and there's only two or three of us left. And they left, and I was the only one, so then I started. And they had eyes along the road, see these instructors whether you was going to make it or not make it. And if you couldn't run that mountain, you was washed out and gone. And I got up to the first uh, inspector. He says, you don't need to go any farther. Go back. <laughs> I guess I was running easy or something, you know. <laughs> and uh, then we were, like I say, we used to go to the 82nd, and then they decided that they would start up the 11th. So I was one of the first 300 that started in that make it up. Took our uh, basic training there, and uh, then we, after the basic training, went to Fort Benning for our school, job school. And the 127th Engineers and the 511th Infantry was the two jumping units in the division. The rest of them were gliders. Well, <laughs> and gliders nothing but plywood boxes. <laughs> I didn't want any far. But uh, after and later on down the line, after it got overseas, why Gerald Swain made a jumping unit out of the whole division, which was the way it should have been to start with. So that was the start of our battle, which lasted till the war ended, and uh, uh, that's about it. So, if anybody wants to ask any questions, I'll be happy to answer them if I can. Do you so, remember your first actual jump and where you were? Yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> your first jump was at school. Your first five. You had to make five jumps uh, before you got your wings. The first jump you make is the easiest one of all. Now, why it's easy is that you go through a training. You go through mock towers, and you go to the uh, body of a plane, jump out of it, and, you know, you, it's automatic. You're doing things. And you're taught that you're going to count one, two, three, and it should open because you're jumping a static line. And uh, you don't remember any of that, you know, the, the first jump. And they bring you in early the next day and put you into what they call a sweatshed. 
and you sit down in there and nobody's saying a word. You're just, and it, it's what it's called. You sweat it out. And the reason the second jump is the hardest one to make is you've now made your first one. Nothing happened. But you don't remember it. And you really don't. You don't remember that. You get to thinking, well, if something went wrong, what would I do? So you don't know because you can't remember it. So the second one is the hardest one to make. After that, it becomes transportation. Now, we dedicated Lornberg Air Base in North Carolina. And all the brass from D.C. was down there to see that dedication. And uh, I happened to be jumping second and was jumping the camouflage chute. There was testing those out at that time too. So, and I went out, went up and we got 1,200 feet. Well, that's pretty high, you know, to be dedications or even practice or anything, but most generally around 500 feet. So you got out and gone. And uh, I jumped and and you get after you've made a few jumps, you you quit counting. You just go out the door and all at once you'll do that. Tighten up. Take the shock. I done like that. Nothing happened. And I turned and looked up and shoot was trailing me. So I thought, well, I got twelve hundred feet, you know. I've got time to do this. So I tried to shake out the shroud line, see would not shake out, wouldn't come apart. So I rode it just a little farther. I could, I could do that and still have time if my main, uh, reserve didn't open, it wouldn't make any difference anyway, see. <laughs> so I my reserve, open, and I was the only one on the ground. Now remember you're dedicating all the brass in the world's there, want to see a perfect, it, and I screwed it up. <laughs> so, uh, nothing was said. I went over to the equipment chute, broke it open, it was down. The rest of the guys were still coming down. <laughs> nothing was said. And we got back to McCall. I was calling the captain wanting to see me. And he says, uh, what was you trying to prove? <laughs> I said, nothing. He says, uh, he says, I, I should just transfer you right now. And that woke me up. He says, you was showing off up there. You wanted to be seen. And on and on and on he went, you know. So he, and they teach us what to do. And He's right. I didn't do what they taught me to do. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't do that anymore. Of course, it didn't have malfunction anymore either. But I think we only had, in our whole division, I think out of all the jump, everything, and in school, we only lost three in malfunctions. Mm -hmm which is, you know, pretty good. So, anything else? Well, what were you supposed to have done that you didn't do? Well, I mean, you were, you were hanging out there with uh, no, no deployed chute. What were you supposed well, to do? Well, what I'd done, we, we used all jumping. Yeah. Okay, I looked up and my, uh, was a streamer yeah. when it should have been open. Right. That's when I should have pulled my reserve. Yeah. Oh. But I rode it a little farther and a little farther and, and actually I seen leaves on the trees and I thought, uh-uh. Oh, okay. Of course it didn't make any difference if that sucker didn't open the reserve it, you know. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, in I think in that book, I, somewhere there there's a, 
kid that in our outfit we call him the cat. You know, he got five lives. Uh, he had a malfunction. Another kid grabbed his chute while he was falling. And the kid that grabbed his chute, it tore all the flesh out of the inside of his hands. But he let him down. See, I think the picture's in this book here. Oh. And then he uh, went on to uh, use a machine gun nest and uh, he was going to reset the machine gun, move on up. Well, it had a belt in it. It didn't take the belt out. He picked it up, barrel like that, pulled it up, and it went off. And he had grenades pockets here, you know, and a bandolier on. The bullet hit one of those grenades, set it off. It knocked him at least 20 feet away. All he got was a little bruise. Went through the whole thing, got discharged, come home, walked across the street, and the car hit him. Oh, no. So, life's short sometimes. So, uh, anything else? Uh, we, uh, I can tell you where we went, what happened, a lot of it. Uh, we left Frisco. We was 32 days on the water and uh, got to New Guinea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> That's the last place you want to go, New Guinea. And uh, we went into training there while we opened up, built us a school so all of us could be jumpers. And uh, nothing to do in New Guinea. We take a jeep and go down to the base, stuff like that. And, uh, of course, we, and if you notice, it says in that thing, the angels. Now, they, they've been taught, you know, how we got that name. Well, we actually got it from, as far as I can know, is Las Penas when we, a nurse, gave us that name. But it's been said that we got it in different ways. Our general gave us to us. Well, I, I never heard that, one, but until I was out of the service. But uh, always stayed in New Guinea. We got to go down to the bay, and ships had, had been sunk in the bay there. We'd go out, swim, and stuff like that. Get into the sharks. About now, <laughs> there was too. And. Uh, we left New Guinea then for Leyte. Now we are a airborne unit for our jumps. We practice it and everything, and we go up there and have an invasion, which is amphibious. We thought we were supposed to jump, <laughs> not run through the water, <laughs> you know. What, what kind of ships did you transport on from New Guinea? L L LSTs. Regular, that, and we, <laughs> on the boat that I had, we had a big D-8 dozer, which I operated. And uh, we also had a, there was a monkey that we, was shot in New Guinea. And we brought him in, and what he had was his front leg was just dangling, been shot. So we took it to the captain, medical department. He put the monkey to sleep, cut off his leg, bandaged it up well, kept him around, and he whittled him out a wooden leg. <laughs> so, so he got his name as Peg Leg Pete. We call him. Uh, in while we was there, there was the mating season and stuff like that and happening, and we was in the mess tent. 
and there's some other monkeys around there. Well, what happened? They get in a fight. <laughs> he take his wooden leg, <laughs> crack him upside the head with it. Well, anyway, uh, we tuck him on. The, he was on the ship I was on. The South China Sea is a rough place. I mean, you it it's like this all the time. And uh, we was getting ready. We'd been all night, and we were starting to break day, and we could hear the well, the Missouri battleship was shelling. We could hear all that. So I got to looking for Pete. Couldn't find him. And I'm going to be ready to go in a minute, you know. So I'm going to go up and start this dozer up. And I go up there and I hung my steel helmet on the handle. And Pete was up there, he's seasick. <laughs> <laughs> he was using my helmet. <laughs> so, but those are the fun things that happen, you know. And I like to talk about those more than I do other things. There's, I think there's a lot of other things that we don't need to talk about, you know. And, and personally, you know, I think we as people was just as bad as the other people were. Now, we weren't no angels like that paper said. No question about it. But uh, all said and done, we were just as bad as they were. So I don't think that we can sit back, because they're human beings, and they was forced to do what they were doing. Not because they liked it, because they was forced to go. So was we. But a lot of us enjoyed it. Uh, I don't know. So. <clears throat> Did you think that way then? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I never thought that uh, an individual, when he was forced to do something, that could be blamed for it. I think if if you're here and somebody forces you to do something, they should be responsible, not you. Now that's only my belief. Huh? So, and naturally you're out there and it's either you or them. And you know that. So you don't forget that. And uh, they had a lot of things they'd done. Of course they was taught. You know, and the thing that we had to look for was a person never dies with their face in the mud. They'll turn their face. So when you when you've seen someone their face is straight down like this, he ain't dead. Nine times out of ten. So there's things that you can watch for. And you, you learn it pretty quick. But being responsible, I don't see how you can make an individual responsible for something like that. So, uh, late week golf is a pretty famous battle. Can you say what your role was in that? The what? The, the late week golf that you said, the battle of late week golf. Late that... Yeah. Yeah, that was... Uh, uh, Lady is down the south end of the Philippines, mm -hmm. and uh, Tacloban is, uh, we were north, I'll call it north, we were up from Tacloban at Nasabu. Yeah, Nasabu. There's Nasabu right here, right here. That's Nasabu, and then here's Leyte right here. Yeah. Okay, Tech Cloven is right along here in, on Leyte. And uh, we was in Nasabu right there. there. And uh, 
the Japs had, uh, well, it actually occupied an uh, airstrip between Masabu and Takloban called Lipa. And uh, I believe that's the name of it. And uh, we uh, had secured that from them. And uh, actually, we was getting ready to extend the strip a little bit to, so a heavier plane could come in. All that come in was these L4s and L5s. And they wanted to get at least a P-40 in there or something like that so they could get close to the fight. And uh, we were, in fact, there's a little stream of water run down by the airstrip. And uh, some of us decided we'd go down to that stream of water and take a bath. So we got down there and taken a bath and all at once we heard planes. And looked over and it looked like C-47s. And they, they C-47s shouldn't be there. We're the only ones jumped on. It was Japanese jumping on us. So they jumped on us before we jumped on them. <laughs> but uh, that was, that ended that night. Next morning we didn't, there wasn't many of them left. So they lost uh, around 7,000 on Leyte. And I think if you read one of these books, they, on Leyte, and of course, going ahead and including Luzon, that they like 200,000. That's a lot of people. That answer, but uh, Leyte was, was probably as tough as one we went into. Uh, it was much tougher than the Luzon. Luzon was spread out farther. Naturally, they had more things going. But uh, Lady didn't have nothing on it but a few little airstrips, a bunch of jungle, and a bunch of mud. And uh, I actually slept in foxholes on uh, Lady that I had to stick my helmet in the side of the wall so the water wouldn't come in. Half of your belly or body's covered up in water when you're sleeping. So that's that's how much jungle there was around. We used to make fun of the mosquitoes and call them mail planes. <laughs> They'd be going to carry the mail. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. I got malaria while I was there. And still today they don't take my blood or won't. I don't know why. But they say that I might be a carrier just keeping it and if they give that to someone that had it, I could give it to them and they'd be gone. So, But I've lived pretty good without it. <laughs> and I, I got it on Luzon. Uh, we were on a patrol and I got feeling bad. So I told them, I said, I'll just crawl in this treetop. Somebody cover me over with leaves so they can't find me. Somebody go back and get the medics, let them come in and pick me up. Well, it took them about two hours. They had me out there and we had to, a medic set up in a church. And I walked up the front of the church and I'll never forget, I carried seven steps. And then I sat down. Uh, captain, which was the medical doctor, he walked out, put his hand on this shoulder here, asked me how I felt. I was keeled over. So after that, I don't remember a thing until I woke up in a tent. They had oxygen tanks sitting around and everything. And I had a <coughs> hundred and, I think it was a 106.4 temperature. And that's pretty high. But I got by all right. Got, I weighed when I come out of there. Had malaria. See. 
And I come out of there, I've weighed 130 pounds. How long were you ill? Pardon? How long were you ill? Uh, I was, bef well, I, I was two days getting in to the hospital. I was in the hospital two weeks. And then I was sitting every 30 days to come home. And they, uh, you're, you're not ready. Yet. And uh, the third, which would be three months, I went in and I gained over five pounds. The doctor said, oh, we're not sending you home. Stay here. <laughs> so, <laughs> I almost got to come home, but I didn't. <laughs> How much did you weigh before you got sick? I've always weighed right at 190. You know, still today I think I'm 192, something like that. I've been lucky that way. I just, you know, I hold the same weight practically all the time. Have you ever heard the term May West? <coughs> yes, that's what I. Well, what a May West is uh, is you you when your chute opens. It is caused a lot of time by the prop on the plane. The pilot, pilot in the plane, when they'll give you the red, red light, and that means you're getting ready. And then he's supposed to cut his engine. Now they're traveling C-47s at about 150. They'll cut those engines and try to drop down to between 80 and 90. And then you're supposed to jump. They'll just tilt them a little bit. And they'll just, they're into a stall. And they can only hold them there just a few minutes. And uh, you jump. Well, if they rev up those engines, have to rev them up or anything, before all of them gets out, when you go out, and you turn and go down, that chute comes off and goes this way, open like this. And the prop from those engines hits that. And what they do, they blow panels in them. Now when you blow a panel in one of them, you've lost stabilization in your chute, and you'll go faster to the ground. And that blown panel is a Mae West. <laughs> Well, that's probably somebody wishing it was. I think he was Yeah, because he. No. <laughs> um, when you're when you're actually parachuting down, are you? Uh, how much control do you have, and are you trying to hit a certain landing? Uh, well, yeah, you always pick out something, but uh, you have you have quite a bit. Uh, I never tried to guide, of course, into a jump area. Uh, it was more or less the speed control that instead of guiding. Now, if you if you want to go forward, see you're 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 like this on your shroud lines. They sit like this. They're up front and back. Now, then, if you want to pick up speed and move ahead, you go up in the front shroud lines. That tilts your chute like that and cause it to go. Now what I was most interested in is judging my distance. Because if I get hurt hitting the ground, that's where I'm going to be. So I would always go up all four of them and pull them down, lock in like this, and about 20 foot off the ground, I turn them loose, and that shoot will go, Pow! and when it does that, it stops you dead still. And there's times you you come in, you stand up like I have now. And then, if you get to oscillating though, you know wind or something like that, and you get to swinging, you you got to cut that if you can because your body comes in like this and misses the ground by a foot or two feet. 
then you're up here then as you go through the swing you're up about 10 or 12 feet or when you come back you're totally loose and you I've seen heels off of boots fly through the air and that's where the guys get their hips hurt legs stuff like that but it was more or less governed than the speed but but if you wanted to go right, you used your right shrouds. Left, left shrouds. Just like you're driving it. And if you wanted to slow it down, if it was going too fast for you, climb up your shroud line and turn them loose. And maybe you had to go up the second time. But uh, you didn't have time for all of that, you know. Did, it, did any of that parachute technology change during the course of the war? Or was it no, it's all the same, yeah. Do they teach you that or a lot of Pardon? they teach you that when you're training or? Yes, yeah. You go to Benning and uh, you take all of the calisthenics and get in shape. And then the last week you're there, you make five jumps. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then you're home free. But they, you go through a lot of exercises in bending. I mean, bunches. And the main thing, and uh, about the school down there, if you're an officer and you go into that school, now see you're an officer, but you've not jumped, you're going to school to jump, they strip you of your brass and all of that, and you're a private. Just like everybody else. No one person is no different. And you know when you get in combat that everyone is exactly the same. They've been there, they've done that. You know, back. Now, I, he was a nice guy, one of the colonels <laughs> that went through the whole war with us. He went to school with us. Of course, he'd never jumped or anything. They took all of his brass off of you. And uh, we had Indian clubs tore on them, you know, to strengthen our shoulders. And, uh, and uh, he was in the back of the exercise. And there was a water fountain back there. And he decided for some reason, he just turned around with the water fountain and got him a drink. and come back and start. Instructor kept going on and finally he stopped. Said, uh, oh, by the way, he said, Colonel, and that's something you very seldom hear. He says, we're going to take a 15, most of it's 10 minute break. He says, uh, we're going to take a 15 minute break. That is all the rest of us. <laughs> said, you will go around this packing shed, run it round and around it and all the way around all the time while we're taking a break which we're going to take 15 minutes you're going to say I'm a bad colonel I won't get a drink <laughs> now that stuff went on I mean it was just a lot of it was fun but that those instructors had kind of tough like question over there I'm assuming uh, the guys who are jumping now have a lot different kind of equipment. The guys <laughs> land on the 50-yard line before the game and that kind of thing. It's a whole different. They have, uh, and actually our military shoots are different now. I went to brag at this flag ceremonies, and I got to watch them. And see, we jumped out of C-47s. That's all they had. The C-46s had a small door. Uh, you couldn't, uh, with all your equipment and everything, you had trouble getting out the door. But the sevens had a large door and stuff like that, and you could get out. Uh, but I went down there, and they jumped with the C-130s. And they jumped, and guys just kept coming. We could, we could get 16 probably at the most out of a stick. And uh, they, they can get 100 now. And uh, they, their shoot is like a paper. Ours was round. Those are flat. And they guide those things like you, you know, you drive a car. 
A lot of difference in the equipment. And uh, that shoot that malfunctioned on me, they was, uh, it was caused by paint. Now, yeah, you're going to say, what the heck they do with paint? Well, all the shoots that we use was white. When we first started, silk. Well, silk opens too fast. So they went to nylon. Nylon will breathe, and a chute has a channel. When you pack the chute, you got a channel that you want to keep it loose, packing it, because that is where, what catches the air so it can get out of there. If you pack that tight, you're going to be longer opening. So you want that to open quick. But uh, they thought that they could all white shoots, they'd go to color, you know, camouflage. So I don't know where they got it, but anyway, the stick that I was in, the first was white, the second was camouflaged. The next one was white, every other. And I was second, and I was the only one that the shoot stuck on, but the paint stuck that channel together. What they decided later on and wouldn't let it open. So, <clears throat> but uh, I dodged some things. Glad I did. <laughs> oh. Did you go on to Japan? Yes. Uh, yeah, we went in Tatsuki. Uh, and then they was, uh, and it might have been the one your father was in, the 88th, that went into uh, Yokohama and Tokyo from uh, Atsuki. Then we took the engineers and went north to Sendai, Japan, up on the northern tip. And uh, then I don't really know where the 188 no, 187th went to, but the 511th and the 127th went north. Of course, we covered that whole side, which would be the, what, east side of Japan? Well, okay, yeah. Now. So basically, it kind of all started from here, from here, and then yeah. Philippine Yeah, when uh, this here, we came in uh, Luzon. There's something. Well, I think right this little Cove going right up there at the top, yeah, right. right in there, yeah. right there. That's where I was at. Okay. And then we were stretched out down on this end where we left here to get up there. Mm -hmm. But we had uh, one bunch right at the tail end there, and then at Suga up here, and then on up into the northern part. And a second. Second uh, day that we, I was up there, uh, and we was talking about a while ago about the Japanese people and things. The second day that I was at Sendai, uh, I met a Japanese uh, young fellow. He was about that time, probably 18. And he invited me over to their house for dinner. And I went over, and he spoke plain English. And I asked him, I said, where where did you learn this? He graduated from Southern Cal. And then he talked to me about, he said, we knew. But he said, we didn't dare to say anything, because if you did, that was it. So that's the reason I say that, you know, 
Those people didn't want it either, but they had to do it. Mr. Wade, can you describe your duties on the ground a little bit? The what? Duties at which you were actually on the ground, some of the duties that you might have had to perform. Well, what, what you're taught, I can tell you what you're taught to do, and then I'll, I'll go and tell you most really what you do. Uh, you're taught to, when you leave the plane, get out of there and get to the ground. When you get to the ground, you undo your chute and everything and hide it someplace because they could find stuff and they don't need to find that. Uh, and, you know, you're staying four and five in a bunch. Don't ever take the whole thing and get out and go because they could do away with all of you. And then you'd be done. But you break up in like four and five in a bunch. And all depending on what you're going to do. do Whether you're going to blow, go in, blow up something and get out. Or whether you're going to set up uh, a demolition on a trail or a road that they might be using and wait for them to come along and work on that. Now that's what you're taught to do. And what you do <laughs> is when you hit the ground, you get away from that chute and keep going. Get out of there. You know, don't stand around and piddle around about hiding it. You might not have anything to hide it with. So you, you just try to protect yourself and the three or four guys that might be with you, and you don't go in bunches. Oh, if, if uh, like, say, we jumped on Tagatai Ridge, well, a thing you want to do, now we jumped there with, I think, six planes, but we reduced our sticks to almost 50%. Now, they're not going to count the bodies that come out of those planes. They're going to only count the planes. So if you want to fool them, you fly more planes and less people. I mean, that's, that's all there is to it. And it's just little things like that that you, you learn. You're taught that in basic. So you're done with your shoe. It's, you don't retrieve it or anything? No, uh, not, not unless uh, you jump. And uh, we did make a jump, one jump, but a parry. That's in northern Luzon. That there was no resistance. There was a Jap division there, but they didn't. They wouldn't come out the mountains, and we didn't go in after them. But we jumped up there, and uh, all the shoots were good. Everything. So we picked all the shoots up, and I'm sure the Japs up there and watched us. It's in the back of that book. Did you read? I, I did not read that section. Yeah. It's uh, where the Jap general was getting ready to give up. I only saw the, I only focused on the part about Los Banos and then, and then some of the other early training parts. Well, that Los Banos is uh, actually one of the best operations that they claim has ever happened. But they... Everything had to be on time. Had to be at 7 o'clock. Now, we put scouts in there, and uh, we found out that the Japanese garrison there, at 7 o'clock, they went out in the field and done their calisthenics. And it's 7 o'clock. Now, we get, spotted them and checked them for two weeks. And every morning at 7, they stack their guns against the tents, get out in the field, half naked, and do their exercise. Not at 7 1 or not 1 to 7 or anything, it's right on the money. Now, we had to have planes, they had to be on time, 7 o'clock. We had amphibious vehicles that had to be across the bay at 7. 
we had to be on the road, have it set, because there was 20,000 Japs down Lake Tall, which could have been up there. And all of that must be done at 7. And that's what happened. And they caught them with their pants down. That's exactly <laughs> what happened. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what happened. But uh, we got 2,700 prisoners out of there. And we did not lose one person. Mm. The Japanese didn't, uh, when they were fighting or trying to protect themselves, they didn't start shooting the prisoners, right? Well, the, the prisoner was going to be executed two days later. We got word of that. That uh, the scouts had already scouted enough to know that they were setting up and they were going to execute the 2,700 in there on, I believe now, would have been on a Friday. Because I think it we jumped on a Wednesday. So Thursday, Friday. Two days later, he was going to kill him. Well, we did make a mistake. Uh, we went in there, and of course, we didn't lose anybody, but we tore the Japs up pretty good. And the 20,000 that I was talking about down at Lake Tall, we didn't stay guarded over them like we should have. We left. Got the prisoners and left. That's what we went in for. We should have stayed. Because the Japs went into that little town and killed all the people in that town the next day. So we made a mistake there. But War is war. Someone's got to make a mistake. But uh, that that wasn't good at all. We could have saved all that if we'd have just stayed two more days. Of course, we'd have probably give up a lot of stuff too. But at least we would have tried. Oh. Yeah. The. Uh one of the things that, that I enjoy in doing all this research uh, for these talks is that was a sad part of the story because the, the 511th troops and the regiments within the division that went in did completely wipe out the 250 Japanese troops that were part of the garrison in the camp and rescued all of the people in the in the uh, prison camp and like Lloyd said the unfortunate aspect of all that was that we left having done the successful part of the raid and in retribution of course for wiping out the garrison and all that the the, the townspeople did suffer uh, as a result and, and again very unfortunate part of the story but but that that's just like many of these war stories, the collateral damage uh, with regard to the civilians in, in all of these towns and cities, both in the Pacific and in, in Europe. So they consider the townspeople as allied sympathizers? Is that well, well no, 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 no. Again, just literally innocent bystanders. Uh, yeah. they, they really had nothing to do with it, except the other aspect of it was part of the invasion group was uh, the Philippine guerrillas that were part of the invasion force oh. that did help in the planning uh, and all that. But So what relation, literally or otherwise, they had with the townsfolks, uh, there probably was some, and that, that may have had something to do with it as well, mm -hmm. but, but don't know that. Okay, so, uh, but again, unfortunate uh, part of the story. Now, there's uh, the name that we got, the angels, in which there's a difference. One of the nurses at Las Vegas said she looked up and said, seen angels. Now, that is really, I think, where we got our name. But a few people has gone back and picked up things and where we was at, what we'd done, and everything. In North Carolina, there's a place called Scotty's. 
and he had a bar. And we went in to the bar and we first started. We go in on a Saturday night or Friday night, you know. A drink was 25 cents. Well, we went all through, 25 cents, 25. We got ready to, well, we'd come back out of school. And then he knew he was going to be there for a while and went in there. They went from 25 to 50 cents. Just like that. Well, we all got together and we was going to leave there on New Year's Day. Camp McCall and go to Camp Pope. So we decided we'd go down to Scotty's, tear the place up. Now that was just in our mind. Nobody else did see. So we went down there and we, the guys went in and sitting around. And you couldn't start an argument any place. Nobody would argue. You know, and there's an armored division in there. We tried that. That didn't work. And uh, DeWert, which is uh, from Tennessee, he's, he was a case. A guy was sitting at the, a booth like that. Now the place is full. And he's sitting, evidently, either his wife or girlfriend, it didn't make any difference, you know. And DeWert walked over and tapped him on the shoulder. And he says, you don't talk like that in front of a lady. <laughs> the guy has said nothing. Well, that started it. That's what we wanted to do. And that place had a big glass, about 20 feet long in front of it. We got through. You could walk through there. You walk through the glass. It was all tore up, tables tore up, the whole works. And we went back. We shipped out two days later. And our replacements that come over and replace our wounded and stuff like that, they said, you guys didn't leave. <laughs> leave Scott is in very good shape. Well, but then we go down to Camp Pope. I see where they got us out of that. And I guess the government tried, or he tried to sue the government for damages. Didn't make it. We got to Polk and we was down at Lake Charles. And it's Sunday evening and the last bus going to Leesville was leaving and all of us loaded on it and uh, there's two guys left. And the bus driver closed the door. So we raised the window and drug them through the windows in the back. Well, the driver, he just got about the seat, went out the door and went towards the office. This DeWert, <laughs> he just moved up in the seat of the bus, way we went. <laughs> there was four women on there and we, he tucked them into Leesville and had to come back and go into Polk. We said, well, you know, the MPs will be out. State patrols, everything. That road's going to be closed. And sure enough, before we got to the gate, we seen the armed vehicles across the road. So they were to stop the bus, laid down on the floor. The MPs come up, kicked the door open at 45, and said, Set where you there was nobody sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> So they took all of us and threw us in jail. <laughs> and of course, it wound up that our general come down and got us out. And his thought, he told the base general, he says, now, nah, you're not court-martialing anybody. He says, if anything, DeWert gets a medal for trying to get the soldiers back here forever. <laughs> and then we got a bunch of stuff in New Guinea and the other side of the story is somebody started out that somebody told General Swain that he had a bunch of thieves. And General Swain says, no, I got angels. They wouldn't do anything like that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
Yes. I went through basic training in Fort Polk in uh, Leesville, Louisiana. It was one of the most memorable. <laughs> <laughs> did you have, did it have a reputation 20 years earlier? Or <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. If, if you wanted anything, yeah. it was it was the one city in America. <laughs> it being in many posts and yeah. overseas, there's no city like Leesville. That's right. And it was, you know, you go off the base, turn to right, and you went down to Leesville. And, and the first time we went in there, uh, one of the, one of the uh, girl sergeants said, <laughs> We have a better chance of surviving Vietnam than Leesville. <laughs> <laughs> because everybody was armed. That's <laughs> right. With knives, guns. Yeah, something. And there were women there. And if you were if you were a tough soldier, there were women there who just flat kick your butt. And if they couldn't do that, they'd stab you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you went, whatever you went in there financially, you came back, back to base with zero. <laughs> That's right. You know, we would, when we went in, they was actually, we were going down to take that training because the other you, s places was occupied by uh, going through maneuvers. And we went to Camp Polk. We were supposed to come out of Camp Polk and go to Europe behind the 82nd. And <laughs> we come out of there and went back to... Uh, uh, the camp, I got through with our maneuvers, and they said, no, you're not going to Europe. You're going to, we've done so well in the swamps of Louisiana that we'll go to the Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> I think each military base has its cross the border <clears throat> city like that. When I was at Fort Benning, Phoenix City, Alabama, was right across the border. Yep. Phoenix City had that same reputation, like you're talking about with Leedsville. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I was in Dix, I was in Benning, I was in uh, one in South Carolina, uh, I think Bliss in Texas, and Fort Ord, and others, but Leedsville, and, and talking to people over the years, seemed to have the greatest reputation for, uh, I don't know, being a degenerate. Debauching. You, you know what Phoenix City was nicknamed, don't you? Sin City. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's right. That. Yeah. 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 You probably must have had it a uh, lot different than I had it. I was in uh, Camp Claiborne in 1941, and it was pretty calm <laughs> before the war started. So I didn't have any of it, but two nights were probably. <laughs> Stationed in Fort Riley, Kansas, 38 months during the Korean thing, and uh, three, I mean, three times in 38 months. And you were much more welcome to go to Junction City one way than you were to go to Manhattan, that school crowd, or maybe to attend church or whatever. You I just got the feeling Manhattan was not welcome to the Junction City. <laughs> right well, Phoenix City, when when we were there going through school. So you went one week, would give you the towers, the judo pits, and all of that. And then the next week you was in just all kinds of crap. And then the third week you jumped. Mm -hmm. And they would go to Phoenix City. And that was Sin City, there's no question about that. But, uh, I never seen it happen, but they said that uh, guys would go down and uh, to go to school, and they had their boots and they was blousing them, but they didn't have any wings. And it's been said that they've been caught on the bridge going over to Phoenix City, and someone take them down, and take the shoes off of them, and throw them over the, in the river. Wow. <laughs> so generation after generation, you know, of just real interesting stuff. And the worst part was weekends coming back and, and making it back before before curfew yeah. on, a, on a Sunday night. Well, now Benning is one place 
I don't think I ever walked a step in Benning. The three weeks I was there, I think I ran all the time. We had, we had to go down jump field, and that's where we took all of our stuff. We had to go back up on the hill for dinner, and we, when I we left down there, went up and had dinner, we had to be back in 30 minutes. Now that mean you had to run. <laughs> I don't think I ever walked. <laughs> and I had a, and my basic in North Carolina though was kind of funny. It's in a way that we had a 28 mile force march. And our captain said, if there's anybody that wants to furlough, see, that's when we was getting ready to ship out. We got that furlough just before we shipped out. He says, you finish that 28 miles, anybody wants their furlough then, come in, I'll sign it, and you can be on your way. Well, me and six, seven other guys, we took off. Got back in, run down, took a shower. We'd already laid out our clothes and everything, you know. Be ready. And uh, we took a shower, went up, put on our clothes. I had a brand new pair of boots, put them on. And went in. We told the captain we're ready. He wrote it out and we went down to Hamlet and caught the Silver Meteor out to Pittsburgh. See, because I was going into Indianapolis. And Back then, you had a train movement. You had one car in that, on that train that was a chain car. All the seats had chains and locks. So a guy got out a hand, he'd take an MP, take him up, set him in the chair, and lock him in. So we, we got up and uh, we went down, got our stuff, got on the train, and away we went. Well, after a while, I uh, decided my feet was kind of hurting me a little, new boots, so I tucked my boots off. And I sat there maybe 30 minutes, and the MP come through, and he had a club in his hand, and he cracked me across the knees. Get them shoes on. So I, uh, okay. I tried to put my shoes on, and I was new, and after that march, my feet had swollen. Couldn't get them on. So here the MPs come back through again. He cracked me at that club again. He said, I told you to get them. I said, I can't. My feet swollen. I can't do it. He said, I'm going to give you 10 minutes to get those shoes on. I'll be back. If you don't have them on, you're going out the car and get locked in. So 10 minutes passed. I still couldn't get them on. And they come back, made me get up. So I got up, I'm carrying my boots and everything, go down, and I sit down in the chair, or in the seat, and they locked the chains in. And I looked up and coming in the door was about six or seven of the paratroopers. And this one kid walked up and asked him, he said, what are you gonna do? He said, well, he, we're gonna put him off the next stop. Uh, yeah, that's where he's going to go. He says, well, I, I think you forgot something. If he goes off, you go off. <laughs> they turned around and walked back. Yeah, I love it. Told me to go back to sleep. <laughs> no, but little things like that have happened. You, you know, you have to laugh about it. You ever get your boots on? Oh, yeah, yeah, as soon as my feet. But see, I was stupid, actually, to get all new boots and this and that, you know. And why didn't I just use the ones that broke in and everything like that? What was I going to do with a new pair of boots and going on a furlough? But that's being young, you know. <laughs> you learn a few things. <coughs> Anything else? The lady that labeled you uh, angels. Uh huh. What country did she come from? The Philippines. Uh, 
she came to our reunion, the last time I seen her, our reunion was in Gettysburg. And she was there. And uh, in fact, uh, if that rescue had done that one dish, there's a guy there that speaks all the time. And you can tell he's uh, from the Philippines. And you will see her in that. Also, when you and I now I haven't seen her in our reunion in I'd say six, eight years. Yeah, they were neat people. <coughs> they were neat people. So yeah. I find that when I run into Vietnamese people, some of them live in boat people, and also. A lot of them are. Now, I, I do have a problem, uh, not with the older generation, but I have a problem with some of the younger, and not only them, but uh, you, you go to a shopping center and it's disrespect. Mm -hmm. They don't care whether you're there or not. They want to take their part. Now, I'll be very frank. When I see five or six of them in a line, I just look down in front and make sure my feet are right. But I'm watching their feet too. And when I meet them, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've done that. <laughs> so, but they, they'll just walk over you. A lot of them. And I, I just said that the, the gener younger generation don't respect like we do. Mm -hmm. I've never experienced that. Any more questions for Lloyd? I do, I do have one other little trivia thing real quick. And again, this is why I enjoy doing what I do. Um, everybody know Rod Serling mm -hmm. from the Twilight Zone? Mm -hmm. Rod Serling was in the 11th Airborne Division, okay? He was in the 511th Paratroop Infantry Regiment and was literally in every one of the campaigns that Lloyd was in. So if you're interested, <coughs> Google Rod Serling World War II 11th Airborne Division and you'll see his entire bio from when he was in World War II. And so he goes, so Rod certainly goes back to Takao, Georgia, Camp McCall, Camp Polk, the whole deal. And he won, uh, uh, or was awarded two bronze, uh, two Purple Hearts and a Bronze Star while he was in the 11. Okay, I it just absolutely just stumbled over that while I was doing the 11th research. Okay, and uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, when I actually did, took the time to then look into his personal bio. And uh, he, uh, his, uh, his writings uh, and his radio and TV career after World War II, uh, some of his uh, Twilight Zone episodes and, and other uh, writings and some of his uh, Emmy Award winning stuff were as a result of, uh, of his uh, World War II experiences. I thought that was just fascinating. So there you go. Today's trivia. One other thing, if you want to look at this, uh, here's some stuff here, and he's gone, right? I won't. But that'll give you some of the stuff on that Las Banias. And uh, probably, I know this one is, but anyway, there, one of these here has got the, when we invaded Luzon, day by day, day what happened all the way through. Also, uh, the, the, the one newspaper makes reference, reference to an author by the name of Bruce Henderson who wrote a book on the raid. Uh, and that book is available in, uh, in any number of bookstores. In fact, I bought that book at Costco back a couple of months ago. Uh, and a uh, very interesting book, very well done uh, with respect to the rain and all the detail about the rain. 
And this paper here is the one I got down at Bragg when I went back down when of the colors, the reflagging of our, our unit is this, in this here. And uh, the, yeah, it's in this one. And if I'm not and, mistaken, Lloyd's in charge of organizing uh, the next uh, 11th Airborne Division reunion, which is going to be next year, right? Right. 17 uh, in uh, Colorado Springs? Right. Okay, so anybody's interested, um, you can talk to Lloyd about that. And I know that there was a gentleman, I don't think he made it today, that was here last week when we were hosting a local uh, Studebaker car club. And uh, in fact, another little bit of trivia, he was in the, not only the 127th Engineering Battalion, but also part of the 11th, but he was stationed in Germany in 1956 and 1957 as part of the 11th. And uh, I have, I'm in contact with him and his son uh, to make sure that he knows about uh, Lloyd's plans for the reunion. So, uh, like I said, that, that gentleman was here last week. So, uh, anyway, just, just more small, small world stuff. Anyway, thank you guys very much for attending.